We are a worker center here in the greater Chicago region. And our main focus is to support temp staffing workers in the Northeastern Illinois area, mainly Latino immigrants, but also a sizable amount of African Americans and some European Americans. And our push is to support those workers to reform the staffing industry in this state and across the nation so that it is more fair and to stop the client companies from escaping a lot of regulations and distancing themselves from a lot of responsibility. What happens in the United States, I believe, what's happened over the last 20, 30 years, as many of us learned in the 60s, 70s, in a time of great struggle in the United States to end the Vietnam War, to slow down the military industrial complex, people in the movement for justice learned but we have to remember that the opponent also learns. And so the companies in the United States, the wealthy elite that runs this, com this country, the vast majority of people in the United States only control a very tiny minuscule fraction of the wealth in this country. So the idea that the United States is a great land of prosperity is a myth. And it has been uh, for four or 500 years, at least for the vast majority of working people in this country. And I think, unfortunately, now we're beginning to see that. And this has brought about the rise of the staffing sector. So one of the ways that wealthy elite people have learned is don't let unions, community groups organize so easily. Try to put two or three middlemen, contractors, staffing agencies between the, the actual work site and the worker. And that creates more chaos, more uncertainty of where you'll work. One day you're sent here, one day you're sent there. One week you work five days, the next week you work one day. And you're really pitted against anyone else in this greater Chicago area that shows up to these staffing agencies early in the morning. These are one of the ways that union organizing has been weakened with all kinds of laws threatening to move factories away. So. Uh, we don't propose that worker centers replace unions at all. We look at it like there's a place for everyone in this particular new way that the economy works. And the more of us uh, that coordinate our work, like we coordinate with many unions to support worker organizing. So I think the worker centers are a natural response to the high degree of contingent workers and precarious workers in the United States. We find temp staffing in everything. So we find temp staffing largely in low wage work, but in all kinds of work. So whether it's Walmart uh, warehouses, for example, or other factories that sell to Walmart, Walmart is very big into temp labor. In fact, Walmart not only has products made in factories that use primarily, and in some cases only temp labor, like say a Norelco plant in the Northwestern suburb here in Chicago, but they also get things from all over. In addition, Walmart works nationally with uh, Labor Ready, which is a national temp staffing office, and they work to send temp workers directly to the Walmart stores to stock the stores at night. So Walmart is already known, for example, for paying very low wages and not giving you even your schedule for the next week. And then imagine on top of that, the layers of temp labor. So in the Chicago area, you have a kind of a ring around Chicago of all these manufacturing areas. And it's primarily fed by temp labor workers, largely Latino immigrants, but some African Americans and others. Uh, in the warehouses, you also have a certain amount of European Americans. But it's a couple of hundred thousand. We believe it could be as many as 300,000 on any given day in the several counties of northeastern Illinois that ring Chicago. So it's a, it's a huge problem, but it's extremely effective because the staffing company is your employer. They pay your, your money. Their name is on the check. They cover your workers' compensation accidents. But in reality, very few people will complain when they get hurt because they won't be given work again the staffing agency simply won't send them and the company will simply say, hey, don't get mad at me. I never fired anyone. I pay these guys a contract. People come and work. I don't know who came and went. And then so they throw the responsibility back and forth. So it's extremely effective, unfortunately. The other uh, thing that the staffing companies do, all companies have done this throughout the ages, but temp staffing and client companies work very well together to uh, slow down the rate of complaining of accidents and 
of racial tension. So African Americans that show up early in the morning to work are often not given work, not all the time, but often are not given work. The preference are the undocumented Latinos who are a little more scared, a little less likely to complain about bad conditions. The African Americans then are angry at the Latinos for being able to jump in the van and go to work when it's really not the Latinos who are getting a very good deal. They're getting horrible work, sexually abused, then fired when they complain. But it's very effective at keeping these two large groups, ethnic groups, apart, and it works very well also with, uh, with poor white workers. Well, it's the increasing poverty, and with increased poverty, you have a, a lot of hopelessness. You have more and more young people, especially people of color, so especially uh, African Americans and Latinos, but also some white youngsters and Asians and American Indians that lose hope. And they're told, well, stay in school, graduate, and then you can go to college, and then you can be something. The problem is more a higher and higher percentage of college graduates, uh, graduates in the United States don't have work at all. They're going to temp agencies, maybe a little higher scale, not low wage, but they're sort of tempted out to do some clerical work. It also erodes the whole democratic process. Not that we've ever had a perfect one, but the higher degree of poverty, the more chaos in the workplace, the more marginalization of people of color and poor white workers, and the less interest people have. People feel like, well, whoever's president, governor, mayor, oh, well, maybe I'll vote, maybe I won't. It won't make a difference. How am I going to feed my family? Um, so it breeds desperation, and that brings all kinds of other social ills. It's a very serious problem. I'm optimistic. You know, I'm a born optimist just because um, I'm optimistic about our ability to connect with other good-hearted people like we're doing in this interview, you know, people that want to think about, is this really the best we can do? This is it? All the money in this country? And if I could show you 20 or 30 feet from here, the, the puddles, the street torn to pieces, people have no hope. The youngsters have no hope. If you tell a young man here, especially a young African-American or Latino, finish high school, go to college, they say, why? To work in the factory like my dad did for 50 years? In the United States, there's no indemnization. So there's no severance pay. You work 50 years, and when it's time, they kick you out. You don't get a dime. You better hope your Social Security is enough, which it won't be. And so I use that hopelessness in a way to talk about hope because if you moralize with those young men and women, they won't hear it because they're like, I can sell uh, this little bit of dope, and I can make what my dad made in a month, working once or twice a week. And there's no one screaming racial epithets at me. There's no one uh, sexually assaulting me. So save your moral talk that I should go to college or that I should even finish high school. I say that because that's the reality. The hope I have is that sometime in great times of tragedy, like a, nat a, nat a natural disaster, and in a way we can look at this like a giant natural disaster. It's like a giant tsunami of wealthy elite crushing everyone else. And we are the vast majority. We have the numbers, sadly, because there's more pre people, poor people every day. However, I think there is a chance that many of us can touch each other's hearts. We can reach out. We are right. There's a power in that. But I just think we have to be very realistic about the difficulty. But I think the more we coordinate things, um, we have a really good chance. We've had a number of small victories. We've uh, recovered millions of dollars of wages. We've supported workers to recover millions of dollars of stolen wages. Um, helped workers to fight, successfully fight sexual abuse. We have pushed to get more African Americans hired. We have a project called Bringing Down Barriers to bring African American and Latino workers together to think about how we're both marginalized in this society through the anti-immigrant movement, through the terrible criminal justice system, which has us all locked up everywhere. So I see a lot of positive things everywhere I go and a lot of people that want to know more about our struggle together. Um, so it's a very difficult situation, but I think there's a lot of reason for hope. Well, my mom's from Mexico City, and she came to the United States uh, in her teens. She became a community activist, 
And I think that had a big effect on me later. She went back to law school um, as an as a older adult. Uh, and also other family members of mine have been active in the movement when I was a little kid. That left a mark on me. And then as I grew a little older, got into the job force, I realized not only that that was something kind of cool that some of my family did, but I really realized that, you know, Chicano movement, the African-American movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement and, and the labor movement, they're not something that's sort of uh, you can do as a profession, but it's really more about what kind of life do we want to have. Uh, and again, I think it helped me see that that we can do a lot better. It just takes effort. But you can also do it in a way that makes it very fun. And you can, uh, I guess the thing I'll close by, um, as hard as it is to work in the movement, hard to get money and everything when you fight for justice. I think one thing one of my mentors said a long time ago is, you know what, one of the greatest benefits is, is you get to meet the greatest people.